Distinguished guests and friends, welcome to tonight's final edition of the ICTY Legacy Series, this time on the role and story of chambers. As we all know, the working methods of chambers are key for the judicial process, not only for effectiveness, but also for fairness. And at events like this, this story normally receives less attention because it takes place behind the scenes. Tonight is special because we will get some insights into the workings of the tribunal based on two decades of experience. For a long time, procedure has been in the shadow of international criminal justice. After World War II, some of the Allied powers argued that the task of criminal proceedings was to render sentences rather than to provide a full-fledged justice process. Remember that at Nuremberg and Tokyo, the rules were minimal. Nuremberg had initially 11 rules. Tokyo had nine rules on procedure. There were no appeals. Much of the modern procedural law has been shaped by the ad hoc tribunals. Today, it is widely accepted that procedures are not merely a means to an end, but part of the very justification of international criminal justice itself. The procedure of the ICTY is unique because the rules were crafted by the judges. And I think um, Judge argues um, this is a power that many other tribunals dream to have today. The ICTY has to some extent become a laboratory for devising a system that is best suited to atrocity crimes. Initially, the rules were largely drafted in analogy to domestic systems, but they had to be adjusted to fit the context of international crimes, to offer what John Jackson called the best epistemic fit. The rules drew their inspiration largely from adversarial features found in common law, but over time they've come to integrate certain inquisitorial features in order to accommodate the nature of international trials and to balance the lengths of proceedings. The managerial judges, uh, powers of judges increased. Pre-trial procedures were streamlined. This led to a partly unique procedure and President Argus had a key role in this process. It served as an inspiration for other tribunals. Throughout the trial, there are obviously hundreds of decisions that are taken and that are less visible, but still of key importance. The judicial work is truly a collective work. Issues such as the drafting of judgments, the analysis of the evidence, are often surrounded by mystery, since they're done in secret. Legal officers and judicial staff play an important role behind the scenes. They are, to some extent, what you might call the kit that keeps the judicial work together. They play multiple roles. They might be advisors, they may be drafters, they may be managers, or they might even be mediators in some circumstances. At trial, they have a key role in organizing evidence collected over years and to prevent that judges are drowning in the wells of material throughout and particularly at the end of the trial. So it's wonderful to have such a wonderful and distinguished panel here tonight which combines the perspectives of the bench and judicial staff. It's a true highlight that the president joins us here on this occasion together with colleagues from the presidency and chambers. He has made timely completion, staff moral and tribunal legacy core issues of his tenure as last ICTY president. President Agios, the floor is yours. Excellency, uh, dear colleagues and friends, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure uh, to be here on the premises of Leiden University's impressive Den Haag campus. Many thanks to the Grotius Center and uh, to you, Professor Stan, for such a wonderful partnership and all the support extended to the ICTY, particularly during this year, in the lead up to the tribunal's closure after more than 24 years of operation. 
I am pleased to see that so many of you have made a huge effort to join us today in the final lecture in the ICTY Legacy Lecture Series, which has provided you with an account of the Tribunal's experiences, challenges, and key moments from the perspective of its different organs along with the defense. I have learned that Jonas and particularly Chris, but also Valerie and Almir and uh, Rosalind uh, don't know who I am. So allow me to uh, introduce myself. <laughs> I am Carmel Lajus, the last president of the ICTY and a judge of the ICTY Appeals Chamber. I'm also a judge of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. You know it like me as the MICT or mechanism. I have been an ICTY judge for over 16 years. My arrival, actually I started exactly 16 years today. That's when I was sworn in. My arrival at the tribunal was not only unexpected, but also until that point seeming, seemingly unthinkable. In the 90s, I was in Malta, had become a, a judge of the Constitutional Court and of the Court uh, of Appeal. I was the number two in the hierarchy. I was therefore very much absorbed by domestic or Maltese matters. But like everyone else around the world, I followed almost daily, at the time on CNN and BBC, the tragic events in the former Yugoslavia. I could not believe that less than 50 years after Europe had endured the Holocaust, on European soil, innocent civilians were being displaced and humanized and lives senselessly destroyed. When an opportunity arose for me to become a judge of the ICTY, I can tell you I quickly accepted what I considered to be uh, the chance of a lifetime. I was fascinated by the prospect of being part of a new and bold organization actively involved in the fulfillment and implementation of the great ideals and goals of international justice. I must confess that when I moved to The Hague in 2001, this was the first time I had ever lived abroad. And certainly my impressions of the city have changed considerably since then. The quiet and calm environment and the absence of the sun initially had a major impact on me. Not to mention the challenge of continuously trying to avoid getting run over by a bike. <laughs> Since then, I have grown to enjoy even love many aspects of living in the Hague, but uh, the preoccupation relating to bikes remain, this time because I'm driving a car. So I have to be careful not to hit anyone on a bike. In the professional sphere, my impression of being part of something very new and exciting deepened when I met my colleagues all from different backgrounds and legal systems. Despite its challenges, it became evident that diversity makes us better. It was pleasantly surprising that in my very first trial, where I was presiding judge, that's in the Berjanin uh, trial, I was assigned together with two excellent female judges, Judge Taya from Japan 
and Judge Yanu from the Czech Republic. At the end of the tribunal's life, the situation is unfortunately somewhat different. While I am proud that we will close the tribunal with women comprising 62% of all staff at the higher levels, we currently have an all male judges, seven permanent judges and one ad hoc judge, as well as all male principles. It is the reality that things still need to change in this respect, and that across the board, international courts and tribunals are in dire need of female leadership and female judges. A major challenge faced by the judges has been trying to strike balance at the tribunal between the traditions of the major legal systems. As an international judicial institution, the ICTY's rules of procedure and evidence are a sui generis blend of common law and civil law elements, although the balance is still weighted in favor of the common law, or as sometimes we refer to it, the adversarial system. Indeed, when the tribunal's statute was drafted in New York by the United Nations, it was primordially common law orientated. And this also filtered through to the rules of procedure and evidence. Uh, as Professor Stan um, reminded you, at the ICTY, the rules and their amendments are drafted by us, the judges who come from a variety of legal systems, therefore bringing to the tribunal a wealth of legal expertise and a variety of perspectives that are not necessarily easy to reconcile. <clears throat> there are pros and cons uh, in discussing whether um, uh, it should be judges who should uh, legislate apart from adjudicate by creating a corpus of laws uh, of uh, procedure and evidence. But I'm sure that uh, this will possibly make uh, for a very interesting discussion later on. I was uh, chair of the Rules Committee for many years. And as such, I was involved in the development of numerous proposals and also compromises for amendments to the rules in order to make our proceedings more efficient and expeditious. It has not been easy, and let me assure you that tensions between the common law and the civil law elements of operation continue to come up, not only at the ICTY, as we prepare to close down, but also at other courts and tribunals. The best advice I can give is to be open-minded and to leave aside the impulse to make sense of international systems only through our national and also personal perspectives. The ICTY's statute divides the chambers into trial chambers and appeals chambers. So when you hear the words chambers, it basically means the judges. The most public aspect of the ICTY is its court process. In other words, what the world sees most of is the courtroom activity from the moment of the initial appearance of the accused to the running of ongoing trials and appeals before the relevant trial or appeal benches, and finally, uh, the delivery of judgments in court by the judges. By the way, but uh, I must say, the way in which the less visible judicial work of the tribunal gets done is practically unknown, 
And if there is an interest in it, it probably sounds like a little bit mysterious, especially from the external perspective. Chambers, of course, means more than just the judges. At the ICTY, the judges are assisted in their work by the chamber's legal support teams. These consist of numerous legal officers who conduct research, help the judges in preparing and managing cases, and assist the judges in the drafting of legal documents, including orders, decisions, and judgment. In line with the judges' instructions, uh, and in addition, there are a number of administrative staff assisting the various trial and appeals chamber. There is also a head of chambers who is responsible for coordinating um, the work of chambers, interacting with judges, and managing the legal and administrative staff. In chambers, our main task is to draft judgments and decisions, and this is a very intense and often time sensitive. It is a discipline that requires teamwork, coordination, camaraderie, time management, attention for detail, and obviously outstanding legal and analytical skills. The teamwork aspect of drafting is one of the main differences I noticed at the ICTY compared with many domestic legal systems, including my own. In Malta, for example, where I come from, I never had a legal team at my disposal coordinating the drafting and research. The judge practically does everything on his or her own. However, domestic criminal cases are also extremely different from the cases we try before the ICTY. The trials before the tribunal involve crime basis on a scale never seen domestically, up to hundreds of witnesses and thousands of exhibits, including tens of thousands of pages of documents. Similarly, our appeal cases involve hundreds of grounds and subgrounds of uh, appeal and sometimes thousands and thousands of pages of appeal submissions. In other words, the demands of trying mass atrocity crimes require more men or women power than just the judges in order to process and work on the cases. We need teams of staff to help us. But what is very important to remember is that the judges and not the staff, at all times remain responsible for our orders, decisions, and judgments. These are the judges' products and always reflect our deliberations, our instructions, and our input. Another feature I have found striking is that international courts and tribunals produce lengthy judgments. I was very surprised when I met with this practice very early uh, after my arrival at the ICTY and saw that drafting a judgment is almost always the equivalent of writing a book. In addition to the legal analysis itself, this requires comprehensive planning and structure, coherence, and meticulous site checking. Unfortunately, there is no limit to the length of a judgment. It varies case by case. Why is this important? Because the length of a judgment automatically affects the amount of translation required and the time taken to do that uh, translation, as well as the ease with which the appellate court can adjudicate an appeal. Something that does not get as much attention but which is very relevant to ensure effective and efficient proceedings, and particularly now in chambers as we are concluding the very final cases, is staff engagement and morale. I consider this to be one of the most crucial aspects of any successful operation and organization. 
successful courts and tribunals are strong. Vibrant workplaces in which judges, managers and staff exhibit good working relationships. The most important variable in employee productivity and satisfaction is not pay. It is motivation. I have kept this in mind all the time throughout my presidency and especially as we near the tribunal's closure when the workloads and stress level are higher than they have ever been before. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today's highlight is, of course, the ICTY chamber staff who will be addressing you. I must say that you are all very fortunate to be able to hear firsthand from outstanding, highly qualified legal officers about tribunal dynamics, how they started at the tribunal, what challenges, what experiences they have marked, their time here and whether their expectations have been met. I have had my fair share of opportunity and experiences at the tribunal, and I feel very privileged to have worked directly or indirectly with each of the persons you will hear from today. I'm extremely grateful to them and proud of them, as I am of all the superb staff members of the ICTY past and present, who have been so dedicated and hardworking in the pursuit of international criminal justice. I now leave you in the capable hands of Jonas Nielsen, our moderator, and will uh, listen to, with great interest to the remarks presented by Chris, a member of my uh, presidential office, Amir, Valerie, and Rosalind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I first wanted to join in thanking uh, the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies for co-organizing this event together with the ICTY and for hosting us this afternoon. Uh, I have uh, four colleagues who are very eager to, to take the floor, so I will have to be short. Uh, I did want to say a few words uh, before we get started, uh, for real, perhaps. Um, I wanted to say that when we were asked to uh, participate uh, in this event, uh, we all accepted enthusiastically, I think it's fair to say. Um, when we started to talk about it and to, to think what we were going to say and how, how we were going to organize uh, this, uh, this event, um, it became clear to us that it was a, a bigger challenge than maybe we first had thought. Uh, we have, um, I think, uh, we can say, embraced that challenge, but with a certain hesitation. Um, why hesitation? Um, the people you see here in the panel, and many of you who are also chamber staff um, in, in the audience, you are sometimes or perhaps often asked to speak about uh, legal issues and write about legal issues if it's the definition of crimes against humanity or some procedural matter um, the establishment of the icty or whatever it might be uh, but it's very rare or perhaps never happens that we are asked to speak about our work and the role of chambers uh, so uh, so this is a new uh, situation for us uh, why is that? Uh, well, one, one of the reasons we are not so often speaking about what we are doing is confidentiality. The President touched upon on this as well. Uh, we are privy to, and m much of our work is uh, part of a, a deliberating process among the judges, and that is, of course, confidential, so that, that is something we are not, uh, we, we cannot have any lectures about, presentations about. Uh, so I think that's one of the one of the reasons. Another reason might be that our role very much is in the background. Uh, when you are a legal officer in chambers, you are um, a little bit behind, or very much perhaps behind the scenes, uh, preparing material, researching, uh, advising, recommending. Um, so that's I think is another reason why this is not something that we are we are um, as part of pre presentations uh, normally. Um, 
I'll say, and the President has touched upon it already, but what is Chambers? The Chambers is, of course, primarily the judges. The judges are the ones you see in court, the ones you see on our homepage, perhaps, and uh, uh, generally are the, the visible part. Uh, but behind every judge, you have at least one uh, associate legal officer or legal officer uh, assisting them in their work. Uh, behind every panel of judges, a panel of three or panel of five, depending on what, what case we're talking about, you would have a, a legal team um, who are, uh, consists of a number of associate legal officers, legal officers who are assisting them in their work. Um, the size of this team might differ, but it's, let's say, usually not smaller than three, four, or five people, and sometimes it can be much bigger, in my own experience, maybe up to 20, 30 people sometimes. Um, the, uh, who are assisting the, the judges in, uh, so to speak, behind the scenes. Uh, so with me today uh, in this panel, I have people who are just like myself, have worked uh, in these or served in these legal teams for many years. Um, in fact, the accumulated chambers experience on the panel would probably be uh, measured in decades rather than in, in, in years. Uh, and our plan today is to uh, speak about four different themes um, which uh, in different ways touch upon aspects of our work and, and, and our experience in ICTY chambers. Um, we will start with uh, my colleague Valerie Gabar, who will speak about the issue of length of proceedings, uh, which is a um, central topic to both when you work in chambers, but perhaps also when you're looking at chambers and the work of chambers from outside. So the issue of length of proceedings and perhaps what to, to do about it, if anything. And we'll then move to, uh, I believe, a, a related topic, which is the issue of um, admission of evidence. And I think uh, we'll, you'll see why I say it's a, a related topic. Uh, after that, uh, Mr. Cengic will take us uh, even further behind the scenes in chambers and talk about uh, judgment drafting, how to write a judgment. So if you um, ever are faced with that challenge, that's when you should pay attention. Uh, finally, we'll move to uh, the, uh, Mr. Lance at my right. Uh, he'll touch upon a topic which is perhaps a little bit more unknown. Uh, perhaps one can say it's one of the few outreach aspects of our of our work uh, that we have uh, that we are, we are also assisting the judges in, uh, and that is the drafting and, and the reading of the summary of the judgment that is done on when uh, at the time of the delivery of a judgment. Uh, so this is how we will organize it. We will do these four small presentations, and after that, the floor will be open to comments and, and questions which can be on this topic, obviously, but also on any, uh, any questions you have uh, related to the work in chambers. So with that, I will hand over the microphone to Valerie. Yes, do I need to put, no? No, I don't think you have to touch anything. <laughs> thank you very much, Jonas, for this introduction, and thanks for the Grossius Center for International Legal Study for organizing this uh, series of lectures. I feel honored to be given an opportunity to talk from the perspective of chamber staff. As uh, Jonas mentioned, it's because very often of confidentiality, occasion for us to talk about uh, what we do uh, are rare, so which makes this event even more special. Uh, my personal experience with the ICTY, I've been working with the Appeal Chamber. So for almost six years now, I have been assisting uh, both, actually, ICTR and ICTY appeal chamber judges on numerous single and, and multi-appellant cases uh, in various stages of the proceeding from pre-appeal to the delivery of the judgment. So when preparing for tonight's event and trying to anticipate what could possibly be of interest from someone outside of the chamber's daily life, um, it came to our mind that a set of questions that could be of interest or that is bound to be of interest from someone outside uh, is why are ICTY proceedings so long and are ICTY proceedings too long? And 
what kind of role Chamber can play in mitigating the length of the proceedings and ensure an expeditious judicial process. And ultimately, whether that was efficient. These questions on the length of ICTY proceedings are recurrent. They are recurrent because they are legitimate questions to ask when looking at the length of international trial and proceedings. Objectively, ICTY trials and proceedings are long. The most simple trial rarely lasts less than a year, and in the vast majority of the cases, several years elapse between the arrest of a suspect and the delivery of the final appeal judgment. I have not done the maths of an average uh, length of an ICTY trial, but I think everyone here would agree that a case that lasts several years between arrest and final appeal judgment is quite a long time, especially when the accused is waiting for to know about its face, and in this case, uh, very often while in provisional detention. But the real, real question is not whether the ICTY proceedings are long, but whether they are too lengthy. Because slow and lengthy is together with the cost of international justice the most common critics address to the ICTY. But the real question is too lengthy compared to what? The implicit point of comparison is national criminal trial. However, if we stop there, I think the critic is far too simplistic, as this comparison failed to take into account the complexity and the specificities of international criminal trials. Uh, indeed, interesting article have been written that shows that the most complex national trial would never reach the level of complexity of a regular ICTY trial. This complexity arises at several levels. It comes first from the scale of the crimes, which is like a very large, broad geographical area lasting for several years and involving a variety of actors. The crimes committed often involve hundreds, if not thousands, of potential victims, and documentary evidence base is massive. Another key element of the complexity when compared to national cases is the specificity specificity of international crime. So for instance, in a murder case at the national level, you do not need to demonstrate that this murder occurred as part of a systematic or widespread attack against civilian population, or that the crime occurred as part of an armed conflict, which is required for international crimes. With this example, my intention is not to claim that the complexity of ICTY cases can justify any length but to emphasize that uh, because of this complexity the sp and their specificity, uh, it has to be admitted that ICTY proceeding can reasonably be expected to last longer than any national criminal case. That being said, uh, there are indeed many reasons in favor of expeditious trials and for the ICTY judges to work toward reducing the length of its proceedings possible evidence getting lost, public confidence in the institution, as well as the fact that the right of the accused and the victims could be affected by lengthy proceedings, are all um, some reason that weight in favor of trying to shorten ICTY proceedings despite their complexity. The ICTY have tried over the years to set up a number of mechanisms to fasten the judicial process. I will focus here on judges and chambers perspective but it goes without saying that other actors like the defense and the prosecution also play a role in this process. Before into going into this mechanism, um, sorry, I would just like to end phase uh, that my starting point is that uh, even though a lot of mechanisms have been put into place, uh, it have the, sorry, uh, the length of the trial could never be really drastically reduced uh, because to some extent, uh, the complexity of the cases of the ICTYs uh, make it impossible to render the cases so fast uh, without running a risk for the fairness of the accused. Therefore, it's always a fine balance to find for the judges between ensuring expeditiousness of the proceeding and making sure that the rights of the accused are respected. Proceeding by chronology, I will first address the pretrial phase of the proceeding. There are two aspects where, in my view, 
judges played a key role in managing the complexity of the cases at the, at the pretrial phase. The first one is by playing an active role in pretrial management. The pretrial phase is essentially the phase where the parties prepare for trial. With a robust pretrial management, it should bring the prosecution and the defense together to resolve issues that can be disposed of before the trial begins and therefore ensure, ensure a smooth running of the trial later. This is therefore an essential phase uh, where the, ju the pretrial judges have played a very active role in, uh, in trying to manage this first phase. Um, the pretrial judge perform many functions where they can possibly positively impact. Uh, this includes coordinating, coordinating communication between the party, for instance, by using tools like periodic conference. Um, another aspect is ensuring that adherence to the timelines provided by the rules in relation to pretrial preparation are respected. Um, this is also a critical aspect to a successful management of the case. The second aspect that I think is worth mentioning here when it comes to the pretrial phase is the judge's decisions to amend the rules to allow the chamber to invite the prosecution to reduce the number of counts and fix the number of crime sites or incidents in an indictment. The idea behind that rule is to ensure that only manageable and representative cases go to trial. If the prosecutor refused the invitation of the chamber, the chamber may direct the prosecutor to select the counts on which to proceed. After the rule was amended, uh, in practice, chambers have made a very important use of this rule and have invited the prosecution to shorten uh, trials in their indictment, sorry, in many occasions. The prosecution has sometimes declined this invitation to reduce this case, but ultimately, it has identified parts of indictment on which not to proceed or lay evidence. So which was, in my view, quite a successful uh, aspect where you can see the role of the, of the judges in trying to ensure the expeditiousness of the proceeding. Another mechanism envisaged to ensure expeditiousness is that when the accused are alleged to have committed crimes together as part of the, what we call, same transaction, same yeah, same plan, that they be tried together jointly in a, in the same indictment and same trial. Depending on the stage of the proceeding, either the pretrial chamber or the trial chamber must decide whether to permit the gender. Not all of the accused of the RCTY have been jointly tried, of course, but this represents actually quite a high number, ultimately, the number of joint trial. So there is several scenarios, either the Joint trial can be done ab initio by the prosecution by filing a single indictment for several accused, or because the cases have been later joined. It is generally considered as a good practice to reduce the length of proceedings. That being said, in my view, joinder will only facilitate expeditiousness if the requirement that the crime have to be uh, part of the same transaction is applied strictly. As, as in my view, if the proximity of the crime is not sufficient, it would or may have the opposite effect than the one of shortening the trial. Moreover, if for the institution, joint trial ensure expeditiousness, at, for instance, it is obvious that rather than running six separate trials, you will run one big trial. This, for the institution, for sure, will reduce the length of the proceeding. But this is not necessarily the case for a particular accused that will have to sit through a more lengthy trial because he or she will be judged with other co-accused. So this is a matter that the judges have taken seriously and the pretrial or the trial chamber must ensure, that's the standard, that each accused in a joint trial is guaranteed the same right as he would have enjoyed if being tried separately. And if that is not the case, then the chamber must order separate trial. This happens notably when there is potentially a conflict of interest, for instance. Turning to the trial itself now, a number of mechanisms have been put in place in order over the years by the judges. Amending the rules of the tribunal in order to manage the complexity of the cases. Without being exhaustive, I could mention the imposition by ICT-wide chamber of time limits to the presentation of the party's evidence. 
or the practice of accepting bar table motions from the parties. Another good example is related to Rule 98 bis of the rules. Uh, so we always talk by the rules, but uh, it's not necessarily obvious if you don't know our rules or so procedure by heart what, uh, what it is. So, so Rule 98 bis allow at the close of the prosecution's case uh, the party to request a judgment of acquittal. And the rule directs the trial chamber to enter a judgment of acquittal on any count if there is no evidence capable of supporting a conviction. So to keep it short, the rule went through various changes, but at some point required the filing of written motion for acquittal at the close of the prosecution case. Uh, in 2004, the rule was amended to only permit oral submission, which are dealt also by an oral ruling delivered by the bench. So getting rid basically of all written submission on this issue. ICTY experience have shown that it is preferable in order to facilitate a fair and expeditious trial to allow an oral motion for finding of not guilty at this stage and to deal with this motion by the way of an oral ruling. A last example I would like to underline in relation to the trial phase is that the complexity of the cases also required the judges to be let's say creative, or take different approaches to the admission of evidence than they may have done in an ordinary domestic cases. Uh, changes in the rules have occurred to permit uh, written statements in lieu of viva voce testimonies, as well as agreed and adjudicated fact. Uh, in my view, this has also certainly contributed to ensuring uh, expedi ex the expeditiousness of the proceeding. Uh, I will, however, not expand on this particular point since Rosalind will do so just after my presentation. Before, before I conclude, I would just like to add that the tribunal have also not remained insensitive to the accused claim that some of the proceedings have been too lengthy. In accordance with international human rights standards, and as recognized by Article 21 of the statute, the tribunal has an obligation to try the accused without undue delay. Therefore, when parties are of the view that the proceedings are too lengthy, they have a procedural avenue to raise legal challenges to the judges in this respect, which they have indeed used on several occasions and which the ICTY judges have dealt well, dealt well uh, in judgment of decision. To conclude, I would just like to say that the judges have been the first concerned by the length of ICTY proceedings and a number of mechanisms that I've just described have been put in place over the years to ensure that the complexity of the ICTY cases does not go against its expeditiousness. In fact, it's really hard to evaluate to what extent this mechanism were efficient to reduce the length of ICTY proceeding. I personally believe that to some extent they were, and I also know that it's generally considered that ICTY proceedings are not the lengthiest in the field of international criminal justice. At the very minimum, this mechanism have assisted in managing the complexity of ICTY trial and the, and the high profile cases it has to deal with and avoided that they were even lengthier. Uh, it is also, in my view, essential to acknowledge that the complexity attached to the case we are dealing with um, will never allow to dra drastically reduce the length of international processing. And I think here um, expectations maybe have to be managed and I don't think even if some progress can still be done uh, further than what have been put in place at the ICTY over the years, to try to continue reducing lengths of trial at other tribunals, for instance, I don't think we can ever expect uh, that uh, an average international criminal trial will be the same length of a national criminal trial. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so uh, you're making a, a good point of uh, the long proceedings, but the, uh, and long proceedings compared to to what, and the, somehow the, the difficulties in comparing with national uh, systems, and maybe somewhere in an acceptance that we are in a very different international legal environment when we're talking about international trials. Um, we'll move to our next uh, topics, which is uh, I think related, and you have touched upon it all already, is the admission of evidence, which certainly from a chamber perspective and from the, our work uh, has, uh, I would say, everything to do with the, the length and the, uh, um, the, the length of the proceedings. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Roberts, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. 
Um, and I'd also like to express my thanks to the organizers of this event. It is certainly a privilege to be sitting here today and speaking to you. Um, I am Rosalind Roberts, and I have worked as a legal officer in Trial Chamber 1 of the ICTY for six and a half years now. Most of that, um, I've been supporting the judges in the Mladic case. Um, I'd like to talk to you today, as Jonas mentioned, about the admission of evidence um, and its relevance to the tribunal's legacy. And one might ask, why is the admission of evidence important? Well, it's been touched upon, I think, almost by every speaker so far. The sheer volume of the evidence that we're dealing with um, makes us uh, uh, something that we're dealing with every day. Um, and the way that the ICTY has dealt with this admission of evidence is, um, for us, certainly part of its legacy. In a conflict spanning a uh, number of years, it can be something hard to comprehend how much evidence can come out of that without actually stopping to think about it. Um, in the Mladic case, um, we have admitted close to 10,000 exhibits. And on top of that, there are almost 600 witnesses, hundreds of whom have come to court to testify. And if you stop to think about that for a moment, you realize that's, that's a lot of evidence. <laughs> um, and then you have the range of evidence. So you could have the testimony of a rape victim or a survivor of an execution expert reports relating to exhumation of mass graves. Then you have, for instance, United Nations peacekeeping force reports, combat reports from military forces on the ground, transcripts of interceptor conversations, video footage, interviews in newspapers, missing person reports, autopsy reports, forensic evidence, and the list goes on. All of this evidence needs to be processed by the judges and their legal team which is where the legal support team comes in. And that aspect will be dealt with in a little bit more detail by my colleague Amir shortly. So the practice related to the tribunal's rules of procedure and evidence and the admission of evidence and the amendments made since their adoption originally, this is a legacy unto itself. The first trials at the tribunal had a very strong preference for witnesses to testify viva voce, so providing live testimony in court and answering any questions posed by the parties and the chamber, the judges. However, as the tribunal engaged in multiple trials running at the same time, uh, there was an effort to try to streamline and expedite the proceedings. And in this respect, what was key is to avoid duplication of evidence. Various amendments were made to the rules, allowing the admittance of written evidence, so making that move from a strong preference of oral evidence to written evidence. And this can take the form of a statement, or it can be uh, prior testimony, well, what we call prior testimony, which is testimony provided by a witness in another case before the proceedings. There are a number of safeguards put in place to safeguard, um, no, safeguards to safeguard. There's safeguards to, in place to protect the rights of the accused, um, with the witness having to be present in court if the uh, evidence is going to the acts and conduct of the accused. This is important so that the witness can be cross-examined. The benefit of admitting written evidence in this way especially when it establishes facts which are often not in dispute between the parties. The hours, days, and weeks of time saved by not hearing each witness's entire experience, which may span many years, and much of which may in fact be irrelevant to the charges against the accused in the case in hand, this allows for a significant reduction in court time. In cases where written evidence is admitted through witnesses who are also in court, um, this allows parties to focus on clarifying ambiguities or asking questions arising from that written, written evidence, rather than having to establish in court with the witness details which contextualize the evidence. So for instance, 
how did they happen to be somewhere um, where they came from, unless, of course, that's in dispute between the parties. Uh, chambers have also developed practice, which was mentioned slightly by Valerie, and also here referred to as um, admitting evidence through the bar table, which is a way of admitting evidence that is not linked to a witness or is coming in through a witness in court. Again, um, by admitting evidence in this way and subject to the rules around that, uh, it can also save a lot of court time. So, as you can see, the amendments made to the rules have enabled the uh, trial chamber to admit written evidence moving from oral to written, and that's potentially saving a lot of time in court. And also preventing this duplication of evidence, having the same evidence in multiple trials moving forward. I'll move away slightly now from the, the rules onto another part of the tribunal's legacy in relation to the admission of evidence, and that's the technological changes that it has been instrumental in developing and putting in place. When the trial chamber, when the trial chamber, when the tribunal started, uh, there was no electronic way of storing exhibits. Binders containing copies, hard copies of exhibits were kept by the parties and the chambers. And it might seem strange to some of you here today that you couldn't just put the exhibit number into a computer and then it would pop up in front of you. The technology advanced and brought with it what we call e-court. And e-court is um, where we store every exhibit and there's also the ability to access testimony. Um, and there are ways of also making notes within there on interesting points regarding a document which is coming out of the witness's evidence in court. And the technological developments in dealing with such vast quantities of evidence should be remembered as part of the tribunal's legacy. Talking about vast quantities of evidence, it brings me to the last aspect that I'd like to talk about before I conclude. The danger of admitting every single document that arises or comes from a conflict is that it can have the opposite effect of what the parties wish to achieve. And that's a clear and concise case, leaving no space for ambiguity. Before I set out the two methods that the tribunal has uh, utilized, I would just like to emphasize that uh, efforts to curb the amount of evidence um, are not in any way prejudicial to the accused. Uh, just as we've seen in relation to the rule amendments on the admission of evidence, um, there's always um, safeguards in place to protect the accused's right to a fair trial. Less evidence in terms of volume should not weaken either party's case. So, with regard to the mechanisms, um, these are normally utilized at the pre-trial phase, and the first of these is agreed facts. And during this phase, uh, the pre-trial phase, the parties are encouraged by the pre-trial chamber to uh, see if they can come to a decision on issues which they don't dispute and uh, in which they don't need to then adduce evidence upon in court. These tend to, if there are agreed facts, they tend to relate to the crime-based evidence um, not in dispute and not to the facts which establish the accused's responsibility. The second of the mechanisms is adjudicated facts. Through this, the trial chamber can take judicial notice of facts of common knowledge and it also has the discretion to take judicial notice of facts which have been previously adjudicated in other proceedings before the tribunal. Uh, the practice has shown that the facts should not go to the acts and conduct of the accused. Given that it's in each chamber's discretion, um, this mechanism has not always been utilized. And in the time that I have here today, it's sufficient, I think, to say that the aim of taking judicial notice is to expedite the proceedings and to harmonize the tribunal's judgments to the extent that it doesn't impact the rights of the accused to a fair trial. I should also note that the full time-saving effect, um, for the full time-saving effect, uh, notice should be taken before trial begins, uh, resulting in the parties then being on notice as to what they still need to present evidence on. 
However, in reality, uh, even if the pretrial chamber uh, takes notice uh, before the trial proceedings begin, the appeals proceedings are likely to move over into those uh, trial proceedings. And judicial notice has also been taken by trial chambers when the trial has already begun. And of course, while that can happen, uh, the time-saving effect uh, envisaged by the process is somewhat reduced. To conclude, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the common thread throughout all of these aspects that I have talked to you a bit about today. Written evidence can't go to the acts and conduct of an accused unless that person is available for cross-examination, the witness. So the pursuit of expeditious proceedings in terms of avoiding duplication of evidence should not impact the accused's rights to a fair trial. So if it doesn't go to the acts and conduct of the accused, it leaves us with the facts. And written evidence on facts can only exist if similar facts exist in other cases. The same goes for the trial chamber's ability to, take to, to admit testimony uh, from witnesses who have testified in other trials before the tribunal, and their ability also to take judicial notice of adjudicated facts in other cases. Because many of the cases before the tribunal have arisen from the same circumstances, the same basis, the same conflict, the chambers have been able to find ways to avoid this duplication of evidence trying to save time. And this is a legacy of the tribunal which should be considered by other courts and tribunals, especially faced with a conflict spanning a number of years, resulting in alleged crimes occurring from a similar set of circumstances. Wherever time and resources can be saved, they should be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, you have uh, pointed to another aspect of uh, some of the difficulty in comparing with the national system with the, with the, the system we are working in. Uh, somehow, intuitively, you would think that the more material and more information you have on a certain issue, somehow the better you will understand in the, 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 um, uh, for, for judges, but also for legal officers, the better you, you'll um, be able to decide on it. So it's probably true. Uh, that the more information you have, the better you'll understand it. But when you come to the amount of evidence that you have described, uh, it requires then certain things. It requires time and, and resources in order to uh, to make that true. Uh, it's not it's not automatic in in any way. I think that leads us over to uh, the next topic, which is uh, judgment drafting, which is of course uh, uh, to a very large extent about processing uh, evidence and uh, uh, understanding uh, understanding evidence. And, uh, Mr. Cengiz will take us a little bit more behind the scenes on uh, see what the legal officers uh, Th are thank doing. You. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And i also like to join uh, my colleagues and the president in uh, thanking the Grotius Center and Leiden University for having us here. Um, so as been mentioned, I will talk to you about the judgment drafting process, and I'll focus at the trial stage in particular. Uh, I should already highlight that um, at the ICTY, we have developed uh, several methods for uh, judgment drafting, and I, I believe that there are two uh, main ones with a number of variants as each trial chamber ultimately adopts its own uh, method. Now, I'll discuss with you tonight the method that I am most familiar with, and I will briefly refer to an alternative one. Um, my experience as Chambers goes back to 2003 when I joined as an intern in the Appeals Chamber. I then, uh, after that, worked for the Defense for two years, and I've also worked uh, uh, at the Registry, including as the Acting Liaison Officer in Sarajevo for two months uh, in 2009. Um, but let's get back to the judgment drafting process. Uh, what does it mean, uh, when does it start, and what are the learned practices? So you've heard from Valerie that uh, the role that a pretrial judge uh, does at the ICTY. Now, once the pretrial judge has concluded his or her work and a case has been tr transmitted to the uh, trial chamber for, for trial, the trial judges, supported by their legal team, will plan the management of the upcoming trial. Now, this involves issues such as the length of proceedings, 
um, the specific instructions to the parties concerning the admission of evidence has, has been discussed by, by Rosalind, but also other aspects, including internally the judgment drafting process. So that process starts with a careful study of the indictment and the pretrial uh, briefs that are filed by the parties before the start of the proceedings. So the indictment contains the framework of what it is a trial chamber is called upon to adjudicate in a specific case. It contains the most important alleged facts, the role of the accused, and it is thus of utmost importance to dissect the indictment and the pretrial briefs in order to have a good understanding of the facts of the case, but also the legal concepts that have been charged, uh, joint criminal enterprise, crimes against humanity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once there is a clear understanding of the of the pending case, uh, the, the trial judges, supported by the legal team, will work on the structure or the outline of the trial judgment. So the aim at that stage will be to translate the indictment of the pretrial briefs that have been carefully studied into an outline uh, which contains sections which will ultimately form the, uh, the judgment. It will ultimately be the table of contents of the judgment. So for example, we would have a section on each municipality in relation to which crimes have been committed. There would be a section on armed conflict, on the applicable law, individual criminal responsibility. Anyone of you familiar with the structure of a trial judgment, that is, that is what it ultimately uh, aims to look, look like. Uh, it's not always easy to delineate uh, these sections. For example, you could have people from a municipality A moved to municipality, deported from municipality A into municipality B, where they are beaten, and then in municipality C, some of them are killed. So under which section that would go is a process that usually, you know, it, it will become clear at the very end of the, of the judgment drafting process. Um, but at this stage, it's important to come, at, to come with, a, with as clean as possible of a judgment outline. It uh, doesn't have to be too detailed. Um, now, the fact that the judgment drafting process starts uh, as early as possible is necessary considering the nature of international uh, war crimes trials that have been touched upon by Rosalind and Valerie a minute ago. Uh, they have discussed the types of evidence that we receive, uh, military orders, UN reports. A typical case has thousands of exhibits, thousands of pages of testimonies. Um, also, please recall that this process starts early, not because to have the judgment done as, 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 as fast as possible, but also, as mentioned by Valerie, at the end of the prosecution's case, the defense will file or make uh, as, as she mentioned, the, the rule has changed, uh, make an oral submission um, asking for the, the, the trial chamber to acquit their client uh, as, as there was no case to answer put on by the, by the prosecution. Uh, so already then the trial chamber must act swiftly in order not to delay the process. Now, besides the judgment outline at this early stage, uh, so we're talking about the beginning of the trial still, uh, what, it is that, what else can be done? Uh, for example, the applicable law section of the draft judgment, wherein the trial chamber sets out the legal uh, elements of various crimes and the modes of liability, can be drafted at this stage. However, with the caveat that each time there is a new trial, and especially a new appeal uh, judgment, this section will need to be revisited in order to see if it needs to be updated. Now, once the trial actually starts, the processing of the evidence becomes the gist of the work of the, of the legal team uh, and the judges. Now, depending on the uh, team practice, and again, I'm talking about the one that I'm most familiar with, um, very early on, team members will be designated as the primary drafters for certain sections of the uh, draft judgment. So one team member, for example, would be in charge of municipalities A and B, another in charge of municipality B and C, another one for witness credibility section, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at this stage, we would also make a table reflecting uh, which witness is related to which section. So if witness X, for example, comes to court and is primarily going to testify about crimes in municipality A, to which I have been assigned to internally within the team, then I will assist the judges in court when that witness comes to testify. I should already highlight here, I mean, judges are actually the only ones who see every witness in court and they can see their manners, they can hear them speak 
uh, live. We change uh, each, you know, we only have one seat as legal officers, so there's no chance of us seeing all of the evidence. So we, we divide it amongst us. So if I'm responsible for that witness, um, after the conclusion of the witness testimonies, uh, the judges would usually give the team their impressions of the witness and uh, exchange their notes on the witness with the team. Now these would contain the judges' views on the credibility, uh, reliability, and the relevance of the witness. And these would serve as guidelines for the witness summary. Now sometimes it happens that you have a witness that is incredible. Uh, and, and, and you know, that, then in that case we wouldn't make a summary. So the responsible team member would then uh, work on the witness summary, but in accordance with that judgment outline that I mentioned before. So the structure of the witness summary would follow that outline. Uh, so if the witness testified about the municipalities and crimes A, then that uh, evidence would be structured under that heading. If there is evidence about the armed conflict, that would go under that heading, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, writing these witness summaries is an art, and it takes uh, a lot of time. Um, and as I mentioned, evidence can overlap, and, and, and coordination and internal communication is extremely important. Uh, at the ICTY, we have developed a manual, which is used by some teams, on how to summarize uh, evidence. Uh, this, this manual includes instructions on what to do with hearsay evidence, how to summarize video evidence, military orders, lengthy expert reports, books, etc., etc. Now, once the summary is actually completed, so I've written the summary, the witness testified predominantly about that municipality A that I'm responsible for, um, I would pass on the witness summary to a colleague, so for example, to Valerie. Valerie would then read the witness summary, but also read all of the evidence, so the transcript of the testimony, the exhibits that have been tendered to that witness, all of the evidence that is relevant. She would check those across against the witness summary that I've written and make sure that I haven't misquoted anything and that I haven't missed anything. Now, once that process is complete, and you can imagine that process can be quite, a, a quite an intense one, especially if there are disagreements, uh, the draft would go to the team leader or the deputy team leader who would also read uh, the draft globally. Finally, it would go to the judges, uh, and once it's the, the, the witness summary is approved by the judges, then the team leader or the deputy team leader would actually implement, uh, you know, would, would take parts of this witness summary for municipality A and put it in that judgment draft outline together with other evidence from other witnesses on municipality A, on armed conflict, on, it, on other parts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so by doing so, all of the evidence is processed, and at the end of the process, the uh, judgment outline would thus contain all of the evidence under the appropriate headings. Um, at this moment, the refining of the draft can start. So I'm responsible for that municipality A. So I would try and bring that raw evidence or the evidence that has been processed by colleagues and try and make a cohesive story uh, out of all of the evidence. And I would merge evidence from multiple witnesses uh, where necessary with the aim of telling a story what actually happened in that municipality. Forces A came and took over the city hall and and push people and, and, and put them in caps, camps, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at that stage, I would also probably propose factual and legal findings. A factual finding is a finding that people were killed. Uh, a legal finding is actually a finding that that killing constituted a crime, a murder, uh, most likely, because not every killing in war is a crime, as everybody knows. Now, once, that, once I'm finished with that, uh, let's say, refinement, Again, the draft would be sent to a colleague, uh, let's say Chris in this case. He would then review an accuracy check, meaning footnote check, everything that I've done there, and also look at it globally. Does this make sense? Again, the team leader would get involved, and we would send it ultimately to the judges who would deliberate upon it. Now, the judges would provide us with comments. Sometimes we would meet with the judges once. Sometimes more meetings are necessary. Uh, whatever it takes to finalize the process. On some issues, the judges would decide to deliberate without the legal team, and then they would give us instructions and tell us we would like you to go in to, 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 to improve the draft in this way. 
Um, at times, it can also become apparent uh, during the deliberations that there is a disagreement between judges. Now, whenever there are such disagreements, the usual practice, again, these are very generic uh, rules that I'm talking about, uh, the team would provide the judges with, with, with options uh, for their consideration. Now, ultimately, if the judges still disagree on a point, then the, the legal team would provide full support uh, to the judge uh, if there is a wish to, to file a separate or a dissenting opinion. So as I mentioned, there are no hard rules in this process, and this is but one methodology of how it's done. Uh, sometimes things happen ad hoc. Uh, each chamber consists of judges who may have their own preference on how to deliberate and how to employ the, the legal team. Uh, for example, to mention another method, there are teams who have worked with shorter witness summaries and who have used the technological possibilities of e-court to a larger extent. Now, e-court has been mentioned by Rosalind, and I can tell you that e-court, when I worked for the defense, made my life a lot easier. To give you a practical side of this, when, uh, when we were preparing documents to present as the, as the defense there, we would have to make 10 copies of each document uh, for all the parties, judges, interpreters, and everybody in the courtroom. Since we have e-court, we can just scan it, upload it into the system, and then when you call it, as, as Rosalind said, you type the number of, of the exhibit in the computer, and it comes up on everybody's screen. Now, this has made life a lot easier. There are other tools which can also uh, make the evidence processing uh, easier. Now, some teams choose to work that way. I sadly don't have enough time to go into the details of that process. Before I conclude, I would also like to mention one other important aspect of our work when it comes to judgment drafting. Now, at the end of the trial, uh, as you are probably aware, the parties will also file uh, final trial briefs, and then they will also hold uh, or give us the closing arguments. Now, these are studied carefully by the judges and, and the legal team in order to, one, ensure that all of the arguments made by the parties are addressed in the judgment, and despite that rigorous drafting and, and, and say on all those safety checks that I've been mentioning, the footnote checking, to ensure that uh, no evidence has been missed. So if I go back to my example of that municipality A, I would look at the prosecution and the pre-trial briefs, oh, sorry, final trial briefs, I would look at the closing arguments and try and make sure that I haven't missed any argument by the parties, that I haven't missed an exhibit that they are referring to uh, in that process. Um, also, parties will make legal arguments, so we'll go back to that applicable law section just to see if we missed anything there as well. Now, that is it. That is a fairly quick overview of the judgment drafting uh, process. Now, you have to bear in mind that during this entire time, and as uh, that's been mentioned also uh, as well by Jonas and, and the president, the judges and the legal team uh, also work on hundreds of written and oral decisions that are issued in the course of a trial proceedings. Also, at the same time, staff members, but judges in particular, assi are assigned to multiple cases. This has been the case in, in, in the tribunal for a large part of the tribunal's history. Um, well, there you go. I hope I, could, I was able to give you a bit of an insight into, into, into this part of our work and that other colleagues from, from other tribunals and court, international courts in The Hague, who I see seated today, uh, will find these insights helpful. Um, for more information on this particular topic, I refer you to a manual, uh, a unique republication. I have a copy of it here, uh, <laughs> which is the ICTY Manual on Developed Practices. It's available online, and it uh, contains a lot more information, not just about this topic, but on the other topics touched upon by my colleagues and the President. Thank you. Thank you, Amir, for the detailed account of uh, judgment drafting and the work uh, behind the scenes in, to a large extent. Uh, the, what you have described certainly sounds very familiar to me, this is, uh, but it is important, of course, to keep in mind that the, uh, exactly how this process happens uh, has a lot to do with uh, certainly the technical um, facilities you have, but in particular, certainly in my experience, the dynamics you have within a team, a legal team, and the dynamics between judges and that legal team, and that determines a lot on how, uh, how that um, uh, drafting process uh, happens. Um, so at this stage now we have a judgment. Um, 
the first judgment I was involved with drafting more than 10 years ago, uh, when we had finalized it and we, uh, we were together with the judges, we, we saw that it was uh, 450 pages long. I think that was one, probably the longest uh, judgment uh, that had been produced at that time, at least one of the longest, and we were even a little bit worried about going down to the registry to file it because we thought it would reject such a long judgment. Uh, that was 10 years ago, and a lot of things have happened now. The judgments are measured in completely different ways, uh, sometimes many thousands uh, of pages. Uh, they have grown, and that somewhat takes us to our uh, last topic, which is the uh, re drafting and the, the reading, of, of the reading out of the uh, summary of the judgment, the issue of um, accessibility, the possibility for people to, for anyone to, to read and, and uh, um, to some extent understand the, the judgment of, of this length and complexity. Uh, and that's where the, I think the, the issue of summary comes in. So I leave the floor to Chris. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jonas. Uh, thank you as well, President, and happy 16th anniversary. Um, I'd also like to thank the Grotius Center for <laughs> Uh, for co-organizing this lecture series and especially for hosting tonight's discussion with Chambers. This is a rare opportunity for us to discuss our work outside of our own corridors and I know it's something that we've all been looking forward to, so thanks. I've worked in the ICTY or the ICTR since 2009. Most of that time has been spent in Chambers um, where I've assisted the judges both at trial and on appeal. I've worked on 15 completed judgments and have assisted close to two dozen judges. And I mention these things in order to obscure the source of any anecdotes that I might give later on tonight. Um, what I'm going to address tonight is what I find to be an underappreciated aspect of the work in chambers, which is helping the judges prepare the summary of the judgment and also what that can tell us about how chambers can conceive of the target audience for their work. So many of you have been to a pronouncement of a judgment before. The presiding judge, as you will understand, does not read out the judgment in its entirety. Instead, he or she has a pre-prepared summary of the judgment that is read out in open court. And in helping the judges prepare the summary of the judgment, the question that naturally arises is, who is the target audience of that summary to whom the judges wish to be speaking? Well, the most obvious and the most immediate example is that it's the parties to the proceedings. As the presiding judge reads the summary, sitting on the left side of the courtroom, at least in the ICTY, is the prosecution. Sitting on the right-hand side of the judges is the, uh, the accused or the defense appellants and their counsel. Um, and obviously, the judges are addressing the parties to the proceedings when they read the summary. These people, as you can imagine, have intimate familiarity with the allegations, with all of the evidence presented in the case, as well as with their own submissions. But who else is listening to the summary of the judgment? Well, on the other side of the glass is the public gallery, which typically contains a variety of members. Um, it might contain uh, victims of or witnesses to the alleged crimes. It might contain family, friends, or supporters of the accused. It might contain representatives of the diplomatic community, academic experts, members of the general public, media representatives. And many of these people tend to have some familiarity with the work of the tribunal and have some knowledge of what the underlying case is about. But they're not the only ones who are listening to the summary of the judgment. The judgment is also being broadcast live around the globe and people are tuned in watching it in capital cities they're watching it in towns, and they're watching it in villages. Some of these people might be very familiar with the tribunal's work, but for many of them, uh, this might be one of the few, if not the only times in which they interact directly with the work of the judges. 
Journalists will also use the summary to prepare headlines that will be sent around the world later that day and the following day. The tribunal's own press release will probably link to the summary of the judgment, and it will be made available on the tribunal's website for future consumption as well. And so for many people, the summary of the judgment is essentially all they will know about the case. It's the first place they will look to to understand what has happened in the proceedings, and it's going to form their lasting impressions about what happened in that specific case. Uh, not very many people will be reading the entire written judgment in its entirety. And so it's important that the summary of the judgment encapsulate what the judges wish to convey ab about the essence of the case. Now, I've described a range of audiences that will be listening to the summary of the judgment or reading it later, and it's important that the language, be, that the language used be readily accessible and comprehensible uh, to a wide range of audiences. Uh, the audiences include not only the parties who have familiarity of the proceedings, not only international law practitioners and academics, but also people with no legal training, persons with limited formal schooling, and non-native speakers of English, French, and Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. So the language should avoid legal jargon as much as possible. The grammar used should not be overly complex, and the vocabulary should not look as if it has come from a thesaurus. Uh, related to the accessibility is the length of the summary. And many of us, certainly sitting here, I would imagine, probably remember watching a particularly long summary of a judgment. And I can think of an example when I was at a different court, and I was really excited to see the summary of a judgment in a specific case. Colleagues had gathered in my office. We were circled around the television in the corner. Judges were passing by on the corridor to stop in to see what was happening. The summary started with the jurisdiction of the court. And then it continued to the procedural history. And then the allegations in the indictment, line by line it seemed. And this summary just went on for hours. And at a certain point for us, lunch rolled around. We needed to return to our daily lives and our work. And we tuned out and returned to what we were meant to be doing that day. And we were people who had a specific interest and made a point of tuning in to watch this summary. And I can only wonder how many other people who might not have had the same interest as we had, similarly tuned out. Not only must the language be comprehensible, and not only must it be concise, but it also should be sufficiently evocative to uh, capture the case itself. This is actually much more challenging than it sounds. Um, you would think, perhaps, that in cases, and all of these cases have really gruesome, horrific allegations, that it would be pretty easy to find language that could capture the essence of the case. But it, it turns out it's not that easy. And one of the challenges uh, that we as chamber staff has is helping the judges to find the right words to highlight the particularly unique aspects of each underlying case. And it's also important to use language that places the case and the allegations within the context of the underlying context, uh, the underlying armed conflict. So the summary of the judgment in many ways is a microcosm of the fundamental features of the case as a whole. And it needs to be accessible and readily understandable to a wide range of audiences. So do these concerns apply more broadly to the work of chambers. In other words, should 
we be assisting the judges in, in, in applying these principles also to their written documents, their judgments, their decisions, their orders? Um, I'd say opinions probably differ among chambers staff as to this. Everybody agrees that the judge's reasoning should not be sacrificed on the altar of concision. Uh, but some people, some people would, uh, would argue that the judge's reasoning should be provided for the benefit of the parties to the proceedings and perhaps with an eye to legal practitioners or other courts. Um, others would prefer that the written product produced by the judges be comprehensible to non-lawyers and also be accessible to members of the general public. Uh, as you can probably guess, I tend to fall into that latter camp. And ultimately, at least in my view, the more people who can observe the proceedings and who can understand what is happening in them, the more likely it is that justice will not only be done, but that it will also be seen to be done. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, sometimes when I'm um, interacting with uh, our press office or outreach office, uh, Nenad and, and others, uh, you can, I can sense a certain um, frustration, you don't mind me saying so, a, f a feeling that um, uh, people don't understand what we lawyers are saying and we don't seem to care about that. We, we just want to say what we want to say and whether, whether that actually reaches anyone, it's not particularly important for us. Um, I think that uh, frustration is probably justified. I think it's, it's, there, it is, uh, to a large extent, true. Um, uh, but, uh, Chris, you have reminded us of the, the importance of, of trying to, to uh, reach out and trying to be understandable. And I know this is a topic you feel very uh, strongly about. So I thank you for your, uh, your presentation. Um, we are going to uh, open up the floor for questions and, and comments. Um, I th think, um, I'm not sure if I should try even to, to summarize what we have, uh, what we have discussed uh, so far. Uh, but I think, uh, to a large extent, our uh, presentations have been about uh, our two uh, main enemies in, uh, when we work in chambers, time and size. These are the two, uh, the two big adversaries we have and that we're trying to battle in, in different ways, in, in judgment drafting or during the, the, the proceedings. Um, so that, that is, you can see the sense that that is, uh, that is a major, major topic for, uh, major topics for us. But we'll uh, open up the floor. We'll, uh, of course, allow any, any questions you will have uh, about Chambers' work. And um, should we uh, not be able to answer, we are lawyers. So we, I'm sure we will make something up uh, uh, to satisfy. Should we start? This gentleman here. Do we need a microphone? No, no. Could you please introduce yourselves before posing a question? Uh, thank you. My name is Khaled Ahmed Chaudhry from International Human Rights Commission. Mr. President, congratulations. You and your team have done a fantastic job. History was uh, written, certainly. And all of you tried your level best to provide justice. I think in the courtrooms, it was not only the families of victims present, but the souls of 8,000 men who were massacred, killed in Srebrenica. And all of you provided those souls to rest in peace, at least at the end. Unfortunately, we will see many more trials, many more global conf conflicts, bloodbath of mankind, because those who 
who are, have hegemonic ment mentality, those who want to sell weapons, those who want to control the world, they will continue uh, uh, spreading the germs of uh, seeds of conflicts and wars. My question to you is, you and I and all of us will have to leave one day. You, sir, somewhere in sunny Malta, spending your retired life, and at the end of the day, be just before closing your eyes, would you like to, say, uh, to, to write or send a message to the judges, to the prosecutors, to, uh, to the defense lawyers, and to, uh, to the people of the world in regard to criminal justice? Your last finding, your last judgment about the present world and the possible near future. Thank you. This is, you can just speak. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you also for your uh, kind words and praise. I don't know if I deserve them, but what I suggest uh, is even before I will uh, go in what you call retirement in Sunny Malta, I don't know if I will ever be able to retire in Sunny Malta or anywhere else for that matter. Um, I would invite you uh, to uh, follow the uh, UN um, uh, live TV on the 6th of uh, December, where I will make uh, my last address to the Security Council. And it will be um, uh, my final message to those who have the power to decide on many issues in relation to atrocities that are committed worldwide and continue to be committed, and also the future of criminal justice. So uh, rather than uh, um, anticipating what I will say, I would invite you to uh, wait until the 6th of December. And I'm sure um, uh, what I will say will be nice music uh, for your ears. Thank you. Thank you Mr. President. Uh, any other questions or comments? We have one over there. Uh, thank you. My name is Kasaun. Uh, I, I came here to actually hear a lot about uh, sentencing. Uh, so my question is probably uh, a little bit different from what has been presented. So my first question probably is how sentencing writing or drafting process is different from judgment drafting? And probably related to this, uh, the sentencing as ICC, as ICTY, has been criticized for inconsistency. So, uh, that inconsistency could, could be inconsistency in approach, sometimes inconsistent in outcome. And some people also criticize it for leniency especially when we compare it with the ICTR's sentence. So what would you say about that? That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, someone in the panel, otherwise I'll, Amir, you want to say something? I mean, I can definitely try and answer an aspect of it. I mean, uh, sentencing obviously is, uh, I mean, it's already been mentioned that a lot of our work uh, the, is done confidentially and, 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 and deliberations. That's also why I couldn't discuss specific cases, for example, because the deliberations are confidential and sentencing uh, is part of that as well. Uh, so I won't be able to go into any details on that. Uh, and certainly my experience, that's one of those moments when uh, we do assist the judges in preparing some parts. For example, we look into mitigating and aggravating circumstances, which can differ from case to case uh, very strongly which can also result in, uh, in differences in sentences. I mean, uh, you know, Ardemovic case uh, is a good example of that, a man who killed a lot of people in Srebrenica, but uh, 
because there were strong mitigating circumstances, his sentence was, was lesser than you would expect, perhaps, on that. Uh, I don't deny f the fact that there could be inconsistencies, and, and studies have been done on that also by, by, by a colleague of ours, a uh, former colleague and a good friend of mine, uh, Silvia Daskoli, who wrote a PhD on the theme. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think, a partial answer to, 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 to your question. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything. Maybe Chris will add something. So I've, um, as I mentioned, I've worked at both the ICTY and the ICTR. Um, but that experience will provide me no basis, really, to answer your question. Um, ultimately, as, as I'm sure you're aware, the judicial decision-making lies exclusively within the domain of the judges on all aspects, and particularly, or as with everything else, in sentencing. Um, chambers staff assist the judges in any way in which they ask us to do so. I'd venture that there are perhaps less questions directed to chambers staff for assistance on sentencing related matters than on uh, some of the other matters perhaps that my colleagues here have, have addressed tonight. Um, and so how does, with regard to the first part of your question, which is how does the sentencing aspect differ from the judgment drafting aspect? Um, it, my experience at least, and every case is different, but it might be the case that fewer chamber staff members might be involved in assisting the judges. And it might be the case that zero chamber staff members are involved in assisting the judges. Um, whereas compared to some of the other aspects of judgment drafting, um, as you've heard, it tends to be uh, a larger team of people that are helping the judges. So uh, that hopefully goes some part of the way towards answering your question. Uh, maybe I'll just add a little bit on, uh, because you mentioned consistency. Uh, I think you have to, we have to keep in mind that we are talking about relatively few cases at the end of the day. Uh, where the circumstances for each uh, case is, is, is very specific uh, and uh, there are some very particular circumstances both in terms of uh, crimes and responsibility and the specific circumstances of, an, of, a, of a particular accused uh, which could justify different sentences for different, uh, in, in different cases which certainly do justify whether, whether that's um, somehow uh, satisfy you, then you, that, that you have to read the judgment for and see if you think, feel that they are somehow uh, reasoned uh, sufficiently and uh, that's for so something to, for everyone to, to, to do. It's all, uh, all there in, in writing. Um, but to somehow compare different cases that has been before the ICTY and, and try to draw any conclusions from that, that's very, that almost impossible, I would say. There are too, there are too, too many individual circumstances in each case that, that would play in, is my, that's my impression. Okay, we'll have a number of questions. Should we, where should we start? Should we start all the way up, maybe? Sorry. I'm Angel Kulakov, student at Leiden University. My question piggybacks on the sentencing question we just heard and concerns the early release practice of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, um, which also remains rather enigmatic. Um, only five of the tribunal's 56 convicts that have completed their sentences have served their sentence in their entirety, and the rest have been released without parole uh, after serving at least two-thirds of their sentence that lowers the average ICTY sentence from 15 and a half years in prison to nine. Uh, would you care to comment on this and perhaps shed some light? Uh, how is that so many convicts have been released early? Thanks. No one seems eager to take this one, so. Valerie would like to say something. Valerie will answer. Valerie will answer. The test and Valerie will answer. There we go. <laughs> um, may I think about it twice? <laughs> yes, I can answer it. Should we, uh, Chris, will you want to start? Chris, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go, Chris. 
you can see us all swimming away from that question to the extent we could. Um, and so I, um, one reason that I think we're probably swimming away from it, and there's a few, um, but the first is that that is something on which, which just doesn't fall within the discretion of a trial or an appeals chamber. And so it's something that typically chambers staff have zero or perhaps only a very tangential or limited interaction with. Um, the other reason that I think none of us clamor to answer the question is that the early uh, release, uh, the early releases uh, since 2012, 2013 uh, have fallen within the competence of the president of the international residual mechanism for criminal tribunals. And so it's something that, on top of it not falling squarely within the domain of Chambers' work, also no longer falls within the domain of ICTY's work. Um, I have nothing more to add <laughs> right now, but perhaps later on. Maybe I'll just add one of you, please. No, but maybe also something to consider. So, yeah, in fact, there is this two-third threshold, which is a threshold uh, to be able to, to request early release. Um, and yes, compare maybe to some national cases, uh, it's done without parole. Uh, I mean, without justifying it or whatever. Uh, one of the biggest difficulties is also that it's extremely difficult for the tribunal, for instance, to impose um, conditions, because we very much, uh, the tribunal very much depends on the cooperation of states on that. And that it's not necessarily something that is as easy as at a national level to put in place, for instance. Yeah, again, uh, just to, again, for, on the consistency issues to, I mean, there's one aspect of, is it, is it good, is it desirable that people, that the, the people have been convicted should be released after two thirds uh, or half the sentence and so on? That's a, a question, a question you can have also in the national system. In the um, ICTY and uh, then MIC, the, the practice is, in my impression, fairly consistent that uh, when you have served two thirds, there is a, a good possibility of, of getting that early release. So I, I don't think there's an inconsistency issue there. Then, of course, if it's desirable or not, that can, you can decide for yourself. But that's that you have that in, I would say, most national systems as well. And, and there is no real, it's not too controversial, certainly not to me at least. So we do another question. Did we have a gentleman over here? Maybe we'll do. Uh, <clears throat> is it on? Yeah, yep. uh, Victor Thum from the um, Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, I'm in the sociology department. I, I've got two questions. So I try to be brief. The first question is like with this this mountain of evidence. You know, you can basically select like what kind of evidence you want to use in 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 a case. So then, at one moment, you decide it's good enough. We can prove it beyond reasonable doubt. So what's that moment that you decide that it's good enough? And then related to that is also the tension, of course. Like, so if you decide, like, well, we've got enough evidence now, also means that there's a tension with victimhood, because not every victim or not every crime will be acknowledged. And then that also feeds into, of course, the issue of, I'm not sure if this is a word, but with perpetratorhood. So that's my first question. And then you've got, like, all these verdicts and judgments and historical records, um, all very convincing, you know, beautiful work, really. And then at the same time, I was in Bosnia this, uh, this summer, and basically half of the population in Bosnia and Herzegovina says like, well, they, those people in The Hague say whatever, but this is of course not what happened. And it, you know, genocide, no, well, things happened there, but it's not a genocide and stuff like that. So I was wondering, like, like um, the, the president said that motivation is one of the most important aspects of the work for, for you to, you know, to produce good, sound verdicts or, or historical records. How does that feed into your knowing that half of the pop or almost half of the population in Bosnia and Herzegovina rejects basically all these historical records and judicial truths and verdicts? 
There's two questions. Uh, should we do the evidence question first, Rosalind? Do you want to say something about that? I can try. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you mentioned that we're choosing pieces of evidence to rely on, I, I would disagree on that point to start with. Um, the parties present what they find to be the strongest evidence, and we look at each piece of evidence and assess that piece of evidence for, um, you know, internal internally, is it consistent, uh, is it reliable, what does it say? Um, and the outline that Amir gave of the judgment, um, the table of contents, if you like, and this moving of evidence, you end up with a chapter which can be very long, <laughs> with many, many summaries of all of this evidence. And the moment that you get to, which is actually the moment that the judges get to, is when they are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that something did or did not occur. And it can be negative. They might not be convinced. Um, so that moment when you decide is, is, is the moment for the judges, and, and that's when they are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, based on the evidence that we have. Um, I think I can maybe pass the second question. Yeah, no, just maybe to, uh, yeah, mm. just simply add to the, to the first question that, yeah, it's, it's it, just to emphasize that it's, it's, it's not at all a question of uh, having a, a big um, ball of evidence and then select what you would like and, and uh, that fits a certain outcome. It's, uh, that's, uh, of course, it would be a very dangerous, uh, dangerous system. It's, it, once something is in evidence, once you have your evidence, this is, this is all has to be taken into account and considered. And that's part of the, uh, the complication that we have described of uh, being able to assess all of it. It's, uh, so there can be no, no question of selection uh, at all. The second question, uh, which touched upon, say, the truth establishing function, perhaps, or of the, of the tribunal, uh, would someone like to yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for for your question. I. It is challenging, uh, let's say, and 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 to see the, you know, when you look at Bosnia, for example, I've been there. I've taught certain classes at, at stu to students there, and what shocks me each time is that uh, I'm originally from Bosnia. When when you, when you're there. Uh, the students, I mean, we have all these judgments available in the language. There's no language barrier. They're all there translated, you know. Uh, all of the evidence are available, are available online. There, there's a treasure of material of telling the story of what happened uh, in the former Yugoslavia. And, 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 and it is frustrating to see that that is not being utilized in, in, in the curriculums uh, in, in Bosnia. And, and, and when there's no, I mean, I mean, the explanation is, I mean, the education system. and is one explanation that the education system and, and some of the professors have been there for years and, and, and are not doing enough to to uh, uh, to involve those uh, to include those judgments in the curriculum. But the the bigger issue, the bigger picture, is obviously the the, the division within the country itself and the fact that that you have three narratives of of the story uh, still today, and 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 this is sad. But um, and and yes, it can be frustrating sometimes. But but that's I think. It actually makes it even more important uh, to leave a strong judicial record backed up by, by evidence uh, and also adjudicated on that high standard of beyond reasonable doubt. We have to uh, also keep in mind that what historians, the way the historians write, I mean, they don't have that burden of beyond reasonable doubt. So we have to be a bit careful when it comes to history writing of the, of the tribunal uh, in, in that aspect, for example. Uh, the historians might conclude certain things much faster than 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 than, than, a, than a court will, and, and you can have a whole philosophical debate on, on judicial truths and and etc. Whether anything like the truth as such exists. So, but you know we haven't even touched upon today upon the reconciliation and. Um, Sorry for being a little bit lengthy here, Jonas, but um, I mean, we consciously kind of chose four topics which are close to our daily work. We could have come here and discussed with you the developments uh, on command responsibility, the Tadic jurisdictional decision, et cetera, et cetera. But these, you know, academics have covered these issues and, and, and will teach courses on these topics. Uh, 
Um, we haven't even touched upon the reconciliation uh, issue. I think the registry panel was here as the first panel, and, and I'm sure that they've touched upon uh, the, the role of the outreach that, the, that it plays. And um, I wish the outreach was there from the beginning of the tribunal. It, it, it played a very important role, uh, let's say, from half of the tribunal's life until later on in translating a lot of documents, in sending people, in bringing people from former Yugoslavia, the judges, the, the prosecutors. We had a program in which we have interns from, from former Yugoslavia in the uh, in chambers, in the prosecution's office, in the registry, in defense, uh, where I worked as well, independently there, because defense is officially not part of the, uh, an organ of the tribunal. So there's been a lot of movement in, in, in trying to, you know, bring the tribunal's work and explain its work uh, to the societies not just in Bosnia, but also I was in Macedonia recently at uh, Serbia, Croatia, uh, Montenegro. Um, so, but ultimately, I mean, we have to see the tribunal as a, as a court of law in The Hague, and the, the reconciliation role is something that the politicians in, in, in the former Yugoslavia and uh, civil society has a massive role, and it is playing a massive role in, in that context, but uh, sadly, we have to be aware of the political realities and the legacy of not just the tribunal, but the legacy of the war uh, in Bosnia. Yeah. yeah, if I may add on that, the, of course, the fact that the tribunal is in the egg and not in the region is not at the advantage of the tribunal. I mean, of course, if the tribunal would be in the region, it is much closer to the people. People can come to court easily, et cetera, et cetera. I work in Cambodia before working at the ICTY, and this is in Cambodia, and that indeed make a difference. But what you can't forget here is that this court was established in 1994. In 1994, it was inconceivable. Uh, the war was still going on in the country, and that's the main reason why the court have been established in the egg. And that's, maybe that's not ideal, there is back and forth into that, but at the end of the day, at the time, it was not even a question that it was possible. So yes, I think the only way you can mitigate is, as Amir said, by doing a lot of outreach as much as you can on explaining what the tribunal is doing. Thank you. I have a question over on that side. Yes, gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, my name is Jan. I'm a lawyer from uh, a Czech uh, human rights center. And right now I'm a visiting professional at the ICC. And my question uh, relates to the length of the proceedings. Uh, as we know, the, the average length at the ICTY was still shorter than the, is, is the average length at, uh, at, the, at the ICC. And you mentioned some measures that were introduced and that uh, were helpful. So I would be wondering whether you would have any recommendation for the ICC to what, what measures to introduce in order to uh, make the proceedings uh, more efficient or shorter. Thank you. They could hire us, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Any other contribution? <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've spoken quite lengthily. Uh, um, well, I mean, that's still, well, okay. That's, that's to be seen whether the lengths of the proceeding at the ISTY are uh, shorter than at the IC. I mean, you, you don't have so many cases that it's easy for now to really compare the lengths. Uh, I mean, concretely, I don't know, because you would have really to look at the specificity of the procedure um, of the ICC. Like, I mean, there is too many procedural difference between the ICTY and the ICC that you would not want to just transpose some things that work at the ICT one and be like, hey, for sure, that's also going to work at the ICC because, yeah, the system is much more mixed uh, between civil law and common law country. Uh, that being said, I'm sure that there is a number of uh, methodology. And rather than the procedure, maybe some, but then I don't know because I don't work at the ICC, so I don't know how it works internally. But, uh, Are the victims, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we don't have victims. Uh, sorry, now I lost my... <laughs> my, uh, my, my point, behind, the behind the scene, like uh, uh, a lot of the... Um, 
maybe that didn't transpire enough from my presentation, but more from Amir's presentation and from the admission of evidence presentation, that a lot of things are also related of how organized you are behind the scene and how do you manage your case to try, it. it's, it's a lot of management in fact, and coordinations and things like this that maybe more than the process that can help to, to keep it tight probably. And yeah, also the courtroom, as I said, judge. I just done. We also had less difficulty, yeah. I mean, you have victims. We didn't have any at the ISTOI, so that, like, it's, I think it's important that victims have a, have a space in the courtroom, but that's for sure will take more time than, we didn't have this issue at the ISTOI, for instance, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, maybe, add, yeah, the, I mean, if there was a magic uh, formula, we would have revealed it a long time ago. We couldn't keep a secret like that. Um, and, uh, I mean, a little bit the point we're trying to, to make here is also, it is what you, what you are uh, expecting, what is the, what is the somehow ideal length of these uh, these trials, uh, and you know, it shouldn't it sound too pessimistic, but uh, these are long and complex trials. That's there, there is no escaping it, and they're going to take time. And it's uh, if that's uh, and that's if it's desirable to have these kind of trials, if it's desirable to uh, prosecute people of uh, high uh, on a high level and these complex trials uh, complex cases of crimes against humanity and genocide uh, then maybe uh, and certain acceptance that these are these are going to take um, a long time maybe these are cases that has to be measured in months and years if, if I can add uh, something uh, to this uh, discussion I think ultimately there are several factors uh, that interplay when it comes to uh, duration of uh, proceedings. One is case management. And case management does not fall from heaven. You have to have in place a system that is based on uh, past experiences, not necessarily in your own, um, uh, court or tribunal. Uh, you can borrow from past experiences in domestic jurisdictions. And uh, it uh, then uh, ultimately boils down to uh, who is conducting the trial, particularly the presiding judge. That is fundamentally important. And I can uh, say it with authority, having spent 16 years at the tribunal, I could see the uh, difference uh, when it was one particular uh, presiding judge in one case and another presiding judge in another case. Uh, it takes experience, court experience. Um, if you have never sat in a court or even entered into a court in your own uh, country, it is very unlikely that you would be chosen uh, to preside uh, over a trial, but you can still be chosen to participate uh, in a trial as one of the, as a member of the bench. And uh, if there is no, um, how would I call it, if, if, if the, uh, the bench is not uh, functioning in a harmonious uh, manner, then you can have problems. Uh, then ultimately it um, uh, also uh, depends very much on what lawyers you are dealing with, and that applies equally to the prosecution and the defense. If you have lawyers that, yes, are ready, ready to fight uh, and uh, argue amongst, uh, between themselves, um, but cooperative with the bench, you will move forward. If you have lawyers that um, uh, don't want to be cooperative or don't know how to be cooperative, then you have a problem and the case will last longer. There are lawyers that don't know uh, how to conduct a proper cross-examination. We've had several instances of this, so you have to be patient at that point in time and uh, try to you know, uh, do your best so that uh, the situation is uh, rectified. Um, uh, you can have uh, 
continuous bickering on uh, the admissibility of um, evidence uh, and a lot of argument and a lot of motions requiring uh, interlocutory decrees. Uh, it, it depends from case to case. There are cases where, for example, in the course of uh, the trial, there have been hundreds of interlocutory decrees being decided. Hundreds. And sometimes you come to the question of whether you should certify for the purpose of an appeal. And uh, most decisions are not certified, but some are. And uh, obviously, then you then depend on the appeal. But, but then there are other factors, like uh, you think that the case is proceeding fantastic, super, and all of a sudden uh, the prosecution comes forward and say, we have discovered um, uh, a cache of new documents in a cave, in a garage, or somewhere. 60,000 pages in uh, BCS, yeah, right, or, or, or what do you do then? First, a decision has to be taken to uh, see what this material is, how relevant, relevant it is, whether it has any probative value. Then uh, you can rest assured that there will be a request to translate from the first right up to the 68,000 uh, page. Uh, and there you have to put your foot down. If it's not necessary, you deny. Um, uh, but infallibly, you will find yourself that uh, the case has to be postponed, suspended, and postponed for continuation for a period of three months, sometimes even longer. We have, we have, we have, uh, this has happened. We have experienced this. We have also experienced um, uh, the accused falling sick and needing hospitalization. At that point in time, you have to decide what to do, whether you continue. There are many factors. So I uh, think the tribunal as such, I don't think it has any um, uh, lessons to teach uh, to the ICC. The ICC uh, has got very qualified uh, judges, very qualified um, uh, prosecutors, very qualified lawyers. Um, who, who, who know what the procedure is and how best to conduct uh, a trial. I think the ICC is come encumbered with the victim's um, uh, procedure, uh, especially in the, in the beginning, which delays um, uh, the, the start of the case. Also, the confirmation of the indictment procedure. Uh, it's all different from the ICC, from the ICTY. Um, uh, in the ICTY, the confirmation procedure takes normally a few days. You get a request from the prosecution with um, uh, a draft indictment and um, uh, supporting uh, documents. Um, uh, you go through it. If you're not satisfied, you call the prosecutor and ask uh, questions. And then you decide whether to confirm the indictment or not. But within a week, you've done it. Uh, you don't have that system. Uh, similarly, victims uh, are represented only in ICTY uh, trials or proceedings in so far as they are able to be summoned to give evidence. Beyond that, they are not represented. And uh, that is, again, a fundamental difference between the ICTY and the ICC. And it has to be kept um, uh, into uh, consideration. But otherwise, we don't have lessons. Uh, we have the book that Amir um, uh, uh, mentioned, which is published by Unicri, uh, in cooperation, of course, with the tribunal. And, uh, there you have a lot of precious information that you can utilize, any court, no, not just the ICC, can utilize for the purpose of reducing the uh, time frame um, uh, which is taken for the uh, processing of, uh, for, for, for dealing and uh, uh, finalizing uh, trials. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think we have time for one more question, maybe, before we are forced to go to the reception. Please, maybe gentleman in the middle. Thomas Fairfuss, Journalist for Justice. I have got a follow-up question to the one but last question. Uh, I remember in the early years of the RCTY, uh, judges uh, talked uh, when judges talked during informal and formal occasions, they often said that they are not only adjudicating criminal cases against individuals, which is our statutory duty, of course, given to us by the Security Council. Judges also often voiced the idea that they were contributing to write the history of the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. And this idea has disappeared f for almost 10 years. I haven't heard any judge um, uttering this idea anymore. So I wonder what the process has been behind the scenes by which that objective has been lost. Uh, one theory I have heard about this matter is that um, it would have been too much of an exercise, too huge an exercise, because uh, we have seen uh, the prosecution presenting uh, various versions of reality in different trials, like, for example, in trials during the Bosnian Croat political leadership, it looked like the politicians were the main culprits, uh, whereas in um, trials against Bosnian Croats militaries, uh, it looked like the military were the main culprits for the um, for the crimes committed. So was it that difficulty which uh, prevented the judges from pursuing that ambitious idea of writing the history of the war in Bosnia, or were there other factors uh, that have contributed yeah. to this? Thank you. Um, so I've been instructed to answer this question, so I'll try. I don't know if that has ever been, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, whether it has ever been the, the ambition. I, uh, I don't think it should be the ambition. These are criminal trials with an, uh, one or more accused. Uh, another matter is that it, the material and the court record can, is an enormous uh, good uh, important source for historians to, to write history, but that the, um, uh, the judgments or decisions or, or somehow the proceedings should somehow have an, an ambition to uh, write uh, history in a somewhat more general sense. Uh, I am not personally aware that that has ever been the uh, ambition, and I, I, I simply have my doubts that that uh, has, uh, has ever ever been the case. If it has been the case, it, it, it seems to me uh, f far too ambitious and, and frankly well out, outside the, uh, what the, the, the scope of what, uh, uh, what ICTY is supposed to do. Uh, the, these are uh, international criminal trials and with a focus on, on exactly that, an accused or more accused uh, in, in each case. Again, they have a very important historical value. That's another matter, uh, but that's a very different, different matter, uh, I think. Someone would like to add okay, something? Okay, I think you want to close. I want to close? Because it's 7.15 already. <laughs> 7.12, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll take your word for it. You decide. We'll, we'll, uh, we exactly. we'll, uh, we'll close for today. I thank you all for listening and for your Thanks questions. You for uh, and I understand that there is a reception uh, somewhere close by, downstairs, uh, that I'm sure you're all welcome to. Uh, that's, and if you have any further questions, uh, you can approach us individually, I'm sure, at that point. Thank you very much.